lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Of the Wi-Fi here in the facility. Um, I first heard Jacob about 10 years ago. My reaction was, who is this guy? Um, Jacob's teaching uh, and his uh, use of uh, the Jewish roots of the Christian faith has, in my opinion, opened up, and I know a number of people in our church feel the same way, opened up the Bible to us in a way that we did not realize the depth of the teaching and the truth of the teaching in the Word of God. Uh, and we're so glad that Jacob's with us. He's from England. Um, that's where he resides occasionally. He travels all over the world. Um, I've gotten calls from him. I don't know where he is, but uh, uh, you need to pray for him. He has a worldwide ministry. His website is moriel.org. And uh, would you please welcome Jacob Prash. Ah, so I'm a stranger in the land of my birth. But I've been to Ohio before. Last time I was here was about two years ago, and I was just sharing with some brethren in the green room. Last time I was here, they were so impressed, they took up a humongous love offering and put a contract on me. <laughs> Afraid of what's going to happen this evening. Well, anyway, here we are in Columbus. But it's the Jewish Sabbath, so Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. All right, we'll pray in Hebrew and in English, all right? Keep everybody happy. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, your kindness. We thank you for the cross and the blood of your Son. We thank you for your wonderful salvation and the truth of your word. We ask you to pour your spirit upon us, Lord God, opening our eyes to your truth. And more than this, Father, we ask you for the wisdom and courage to be not only hearers of your word, but doers also. In the name of the one who saved us, Jesus the Messiah. Amen. I've been told tonight to speak a little differently than we're going to do tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll be focusing more on prophetic issues, but tonight I was told to speak on the relationship between prophecy and evangelism. And those are two things inextricably related. There's somebody in Hebrew called Ishayahu Hanavi. Ishayahu Hanavi. Better known to most people as Isaiah the prophet. And this is what he says in chapter 1, verse 18, God speaking through him in the first person. Isaiah is speaking in the first person. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Reason. In the New Testament, Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus, better known as Paul the Apostle, says, our faith is reasonable. The true gospel of Jesus is not an intellectual faith. 
But unlike religion, it is intellectually credible. It is intellectually defensible. There is empirical proof for its historicity and for the claims of Jesus. Come, let us reason together. I was a product of the 1960s. I suppose rather strange by modern standards, or maybe not so strange. But at that time, I basically thought, well, you know, Jesus was the messenger, the enlightened one for his time and his culture, and Buddha was the enlightened one for his time and his culture, and Zoroaster was the enlightened one for his time and his culture, and Moses was the enlightened one for his time and his culture, and the Beatles and Bob Dylan and Jimi Hendrix are the ones for now. So I thought, seems crazy, but a lot of hippies and university students thought that way or something like that. And it was the era of civil rights. I remember as a little kid going to Florida, my parents driving me from New York, New Jersey, down to the south. And we crossed the Mason-Dixon line, it was another world. I remember white only, this is Klan country, I never saw anything like this. And, you know, we didn't have this. You know. <laughs> And my parents explaining to me when I was a little kid, this goes back to the Civil War and all this, and I couldn't understand. It's a different world to me. Black people coming back from Vietnam and couldn't go to university in Mississippi or Alabama and things like this. And uh, there was no 18-year-old vote. You know, you'd get drafted, go to Vietnam, but there was no war declared, as the Constitution said. It was just uh, go to Vietnam, and if you don't, you're a pinko communist or something. But at the same time, we had detente. Our own government was trading with the communists, at the same time telling our youth to go fight them. I couldn't work this out. So I did what a lot of people of my generation did. I moved to the political left. I thought that communism, Marxism, was the way forward. Actually, I always had doubts, because when I was 14, I read this book, Animal Farm. I had my doubts. <laughs> but before too long, I found out that our Pepsi generation, our young people, the people of the youth culture, the subculture, the counterculture, instead of finding love and peace and truth, all I found was STDs and people ripping each other off and drug deals and overdoses and the rest of it. <laughs> the world just didn't work and I didn't know why. My background was in science. I was studying to be a medical scientist. I was interested in neuroendocrinology. There were, of course, three impediments to my academic progress. Dope and sex and rock and roll. As a result, I never did get the Nobel Prize. However, my interest was in science. I would not believe what I could not prove. I believed the occult had to be scientifically investigated. Commonly, I could meet somebody I never saw before and tell them what sign of the zodiac they were. I could even tell somebody what their cusp was. Now, I didn't realize this is what the scripture calls in Hebrew, avot, familiar spirits. There was some demonic power giving me. That. And uh, I had a friend in New Jersey who was a drug dealer, and his wife was a practicing witch. She actually practiced witchcraft. And she used to read my tarot cards. And she saw in the tarot cards I was going to become a Christian. And she began freaking out with the tarot cards. Don't come back and burn me. Don't come. What do you, calm down, roll the joint. What are you talking about? You know? Well, anyway, I wouldn't believe what I couldn't prove. In those days, they called hippies freaks, speed freaks, acid freaks. But then we had these people called Jesus freaks. Amen. And these were guys who were like us, only they had this born-again experience. And there was stuff I couldn't believe. I saw guys coming back from Vietnam strung out on heroin. They were on 120 milligrams of methadone a day, some of them getting saved and quitting no cold turkey, bang. I mean, not just one here and one there, lots and lots of them, <laughs> lots of them. I mean, I see, I knew guys who were freaked out and something was happening. That was the last time there was an authentic revival in the United States was, was this movement among the hippies. But it happened outside the mainstream churches for the most part. And you know, if there's another revival in America, if there is another revival before Jesus comes, it'll have to take place outside of the mainstream churches and denominations. Be that as it may, 
I needed proof. Prove it. I'm not here to offend anybody tonight, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Come, let us reason. Our faith is reasonable. It's got to be reasonable. Prove it. That's what you say. Prove it. People of my generation turned towards Eastern religion. They saw the hypocrisy and corruption of mainstream Christendom, and so they looked to Eastern mysticism. Is it reasonable? I remember walking through the streets of Mumbai, Bombay, India one time. True story. A mound of stinking garbage, about twice the length of this table, and a little boy about 18 months old, obviously tuberculous, severely malnourished, laying on a mound of stinking garbage in the middle of a huge city. He was from the outcasts in the caste system. He was a Dalit. And there were thousands and thousands of people, thousands, it's a huge city, passing him by every hour. There must have been several thousand people just walking down that one street. Just leaving the kid there. And he was one of only God knows how many thousands and thousands of young children like that in India. Right up the road. This is a big city now. Right up the road. I saw it with my own eyes. They were giving cows sacks of wheat. The life of the cow was worth more than the life of the baby. My reason said, shoot the cow and give the kid a steak. <laughs> but the Hindu religion said, no, that's his karma. That's not social injustice. It's supposed to be that way. He was a bad boy in a previous life. That's why he's like that. And then I come to Great Britain or the United States or Australia, and I see people in the Western world, in the Judeo-Christian world, turning towards Eastern religion. Go look at what that religion has done for India. I've seen it. But the churches are growing in India. Allahu Akbar! Allah na bibi ke falak mabsot is mi Yaakov. Alhamdulillah. I lived in the Middle East for years. I lived there for years. For years. Muhammad married Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakir, when she was six. At the age of 54, when she was nine, he took her virginity. A 54-year-old man takes the virginity of a little girl. This is a greater prophet than anybody, greater than Jesus, they say. Huh? Jesus said, it's better to have a millstone tied around your neck and be cast into the sea than to hurt a little child. Mohammed had other ideas. It just is not reasonable. I want a reason. No Muslims ever been able to answer the question. Buddha, Guatama. Buddha never claimed to be God. He was simply reacting against the injustices of Hinduism and the caste system. It's written, a woman came to the Buddha and said, Oh, Master Buddha Gautama, my son, my only son is dead. My heart is grieved. I can't cope with the pain, the anguish, my only son. What can I do, Oh, Master Buddha? Gautama told her, my daughter, you must plant an acorn, but you must find this acorn in a house where no one has ever died. She returns after many years to Gautama and says, Oh, Master Buddha, I've sought to do as you have said, but I have not been able to find a house in all of India where no one has ever died. His reply, you have learned a great lesson, my daughter. He didn't claim to have a solution to the problem of death, but Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The man believeth in me. 
Though he die, yet shall he live. He was either lying or telling the truth. Not only did Jesus claim to have a solution to death that Buddha didn't, but Jesus claimed to be the solution. I want a reason. But then there are people who said that Christian, Christian, whatever that means. I know what it's supposed to mean, but what it actually means. It's pretty obvious. Christianity began as a faith in Israel. It was transformed into a philosophy in Greece. It was transformed into an empire in Rome. And it was transformed into a 5013C tax-deductible corporation in the United States. <laughs> Christian, all kinds of Christians, all kinds, all kinds of Christians. Mormons say they're Christians. I was in Utah once and I had a copy of the Discourse of Brigham Young, volume 17. And these Mormons were going around with t-shirts. Brigham Young said it, I believe it, that settles it. That was on the t-shirts. So I had the Journal of Discourses. Joseph Smith said there's Quakers living on the moon, but Brigham Young said there's Quakers living on the sun who live to be a thousand years old. Brigham Young said it, and you believe it. That settles it. So they did the usual Mormon mantra. I got a burn into my bosom and I'll testify to you the Church of Latter-day Saints is true. Yeah. And I got a burn into my bosom and I testify to you, this Quakers are living on the moon. <laughs> Give me a reason, will you? Then there's Charles Tazzy Russell, Jehovah's Witness. They say they're Christian. That guy has made so many false prophecies, as did his successors like Nathan Noah and Rutherford. He's made so many false prophecies, he's almost catching up with Rick Joyner. <laughs> Why should you believe somebody who always calls it wrong chronically, continually? Give me a reason. I need a reason. I need a reason. In the name of the Father, the Father, and the Spirit of the Yeah! The greatest woman who ever lived was undoubtedly Mary. Really, Miriam was her name. A nice Jewish girl. Probably a teenager with a dark complexion, certainly dark hair and dark eyes. And the angel Gabriel appears to her in the Magnificat and tells her, Blessed are you among women. This is the greatest woman who ever lived. The Messiah, who would be God in human form, becomes incarnate inside of her. The greatest woman who ever lived. And when Gabriel, Gabriel, the mighty one of God, tells her, You're the greatest woman who ever lived, the first words out of her mouth. Your baby will save his people from their sin. You're the greatest woman who ever lived. Blessed are you among women. First words out of her mouth. My soul rejoices in God, my Savior. Now, if the greatest woman who ever lived says she needs to be saved from sin and the Pope says she didn't, who do I believe, Mary or the Pope? Personally, I believe Mary, Miriam. I love Mi Miriam. I extol Miriam. I think Miriam is fantastic. I think Miriam is sensational. I think Miriam is absolutely terrific. I can't wait to get to heaven to, among others, meet Miriam. I love Miriam. But I don't want anything to do with that stupid, dumb, blonde, bimbo, shiksa, Mary. They're two different women. I need a reason. Give me a reason. 
I don't want religion. I want reason. There are three differences between religion and the gospel. Three. I discovered this the hard way. Maybe you'll discover it the easy way. First difference, religion is a blind faith. You need something to deal with your fear of death or to deal with your paranoia about the unknown and the great beyond or whatever it is. Buy my product. Subscribe to my sect. It's a blind faith. Scripture says, come let us reason. It's not blind, there's reasons. Lots of reasons. Second difference is this. Religion teaches something about the so-called brotherhood of man. Oh, we can all be one. If we only get it together, we can get the program right. They've been saying that since they built the Tower of Babel, and they always get the program wrong. The scriptures do not say build the brotherhood of man. It says build the kingdom of God. Yeah. Man is not basically good. Man was intended to be basically good. He was created basically good, but we are basically corrupt. Yeah, when I was a teenager, I'd go out and do stuff sexually with somebody's sister or somebody's daughter. I would never want somebody to do it with mine if they weren't married to her. I was a hypocrite. We're corrupt. Nice Jewish boy from New Zealand is Ray Comfort. I did a conference with him once in England. Great guy, very funny. He asked some good questions. How many lies do you have to tell to be a liar? <laughs> Every one of us is a liar. And if we say we're not a liar, then we're a big liar. <laughs> that's only the beginning. Then there's a third difference. One is reason. Second is man is not basically good, he's basically fallen. But the third is religion is man trying to reach God. It doesn't matter if it's the Jehovah's Witness knocking on the door, the Catholic going to the Novena, the Orthodox Jew who's rejected his Messiah keeping the mitzvot, the Muslim going on the Hajj. It doesn't matter. Could be a Hindu going to the Maha Kumbh Mila. Take your pick. Every religion is man trying to reach God. The scriptures say, because of our sin, the gap between man and God is too great. We will never reach him. The gospel is not man trying to reach God. The gospel is God trying to reach man by becoming one of us <laughs> to take our sin, to pay the price for what we did and what we are, to take our death in order to give us his life. Yeah. It's the fundamental opposite of religion. Now, I had an advantage. Nobody had to convince me I was a sinner. I didn't take a lot of convincing. If you look in the scriptures, it was tax gatherers, as David said, it was harlots, it was <laughs> reprobates of every description that followed Jesus. It was religious people who wanted them dead. Things haven't changed much. Now, in order to really believe in Jesus, and have him forgive your sins by paying the price for what you did. And to give you eternal life, you don't have to be an absolute reprobate, as I was. You don't have to be a cocaine addict, as I was when I was in my teens. You don't have to be a drug dealer, as I was, which is how I subsidized my cocaine addiction. You don't have to do that. You don't have to be any of those things. You don't have to be a homosexual or a prostitute or a pimp. But it helps. <laughs> At least you know what you are. I'm telling you, Jesus spoke of the devil as a real person. 
and I'm convinced he gets more people into hell with religion then he does all the immorality, all the substance abuse, all the greed, all the corruption put together. If you want religion, you can have religion. But if you want salvation, you can have salvation. There's a catch. You can't have both. You can waste your time, your life, and your energy trying to reach God, but it won't work, or you can accept that he reached out to you we don't do these things to get saved. I do this stuff because I've been saved. <laughs> no religion could ever save anybody. Some people like to say today, all religions lead to the same place. They do, the pit of hell. <laughs> Nobody ever went to heaven because of religion. In all human history, nobody has ever gone to heaven because of religion, and nobody ever will. Countless people have gone to hell because of religion, and many more shall undoubtedly follow tragically. Many people go to hell because of religion, but nobody goes to heaven because of religion. You can only go to heaven because of Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah. Yeah, prove it. Give me a reason. So what I did when I met the Jesus freaks was I began taking the probability theorems that I learned in university and I applied them to scriptural prophecy looking for a margin of deviation. Basic formulas like Occam's razor, things today that are largely replaced by algorithms and diagnostic aid software. But in those days, they knew what was coming. There was a lot of emphasis in medical education, biomedical education on statistical math in those days because they knew what was going to be coming in the future. So I took these uh, probability theorems and I began trying to disprove the scripture. I wasn't out to prove it. I was out to disprove it. Now, I was never an atheist. I was an agnostic. I knew there had to be some kind of a god or something. But I didn't profess to know who or what he was. And I certainly wouldn't believe what I couldn't prove. I was out to disprove the gospel. I was out to disprove the Jesus freaks. I was out to disprove the claims of Jesus. So I began. A simple trip to the British Museum would confirm to anybody that the Tanakh, the Old Testament, was written centuries before Jesus was born. Nobody can deny that. Even atheists cannot deny that. And I began going through this stuff. Micah Hanavi, Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. It was amazing to me. Oh, you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you will go forth from me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from days of eternity. I can read the Hebrew. Somebody was going to be born in Bethlehem who would be pre-existent. All right. Interesting. But it proves nothing. Except when I got to Zechariah chapter 11, verse 13. He would be betrayed by his friend for the exact price his friend would betray him for. 30 pieces of silver. Now it got a little bit more interesting. 
But then I got to Psalm 22. They would gamble for his clothes. Oh, but they just could have made that in what a liberal theologian would call an ex vaticina interpolation. Wrote it after the fact to make it look like it happened when it really didn't. Yeah, except that it says that they would crucify him 600 years before crucifixion was invented in the Western world. <laughs> then I got to Isaiah 11. And I read on in Isaiah to chapter 12. I'm sorry, uh, Zechariah chapter 11 to chapter 12. It says the Jews would look upon who they crucified. But then back to Isaiah chapter 11. The Amim, the nations, the peoples, the Gentiles would resort to him. This person, who Jews call the Messiah, Hamoshiach, he would cause Gentile nations to believe in the Jewish God. Their whole history, everybody's hated them to this day. We hate you, Jew. We don't like you, Jew. We don't want you in Argentina. We don't want you in Russia. We don't want you in France. We don't want you in Argentina or Romania. We don't want you even in your own land. But we believe in your God. <laughs> but we believe in your Jesus but we believe in your scripture, why would you believe in the God and the scripture and the Messiah of a nation and a people who you don't even like? But that's what it says was gonna happen. You gotta understand my family are Jewish. My children are born in Galilee. Quite a thing. It went on and on like this. The scriptures of crucifixion in Psalm 69. Incredible predictions. Not a few things. Not dozens of things. Hundreds of things. Hundreds of things that I could absolutely document with archaeological proof that were written centuries before he was born. Most of which neither he nor his disciples could have had any possible control over. So I said, well, why, why didn't his own people believe in him? Why didn't the Romans believe in him? I came across something called the Avodah Zerah. It was written by rabbis who were trying to persuade other Jews not to believe in him, because a lot of Jews were believing in him by the second century. And it said, Yeshu, derogatory term for Yeshua. It's an acronym meaning may his name be blotted out. Did miracles as no other rabbi, Nassim ben Niflaot. that he was crucified by the Romans at Passover, that he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven from the Mount of Olives. That was not written by Jews who believed in him. That was written by rabbis who did not believe in him and who were trying to persuade other Jews not to believe in him. It's one thing when your followers say you did these things but it's something very different when your opponents admit it. I had a problem. Roman historians like Tacitus, Suetonius, it was known throughout the Roman Empire. People were willing to die the cruelest of deaths, even see their families martyred, testifying this man was alive after he was dead. Not a Jim Jones thing down in the jungle in Guiana. Some in Rome, some in the Middle East, some in North Africa, some in Greece. We saw him. He is risen. We're not afraid to die. 
He is risen. He's going to raise us up on the last day. Now I had some reasons. Lots of reasons. It wasn't like Nostradamus, how do you want to interpret it, post facto. It wasn't like the Tibetan Book of the Dead or the Book of Mormon or the Koran or the Hadith. These were direct, literal, prophetic predictions that happened that could be historically documented by sources outside of the scripture that even his enemies admitted he did it. Come, let us reason, saith the Lord. With so much evidence, who wouldn't believe it? Why won't you believe it? Because of our sin. It got to the point. There was so much empirical evidence for the claims of Jesus. I'm telling you the truth. I wasn't out to prove it now. I was out to disprove it. Just based on the evidence, it would have taken me more faith to reject Jesus than it did to accept him. I'm convinced if anybody's honest, it'll take you at least as much, probably more faith to reject him than it does to accept him. You can't explain that stuff. You can explain Nostradamus, you can explain the I Ching, or you can explain the Ouija board, or you can explain all, but you can't explain that. It's too much. Too much proof. But we're here tonight to talk about prophecy. These things were prophecies about his first coming. But the same as there's a plethora of prophecy about his first coming, there is co-equally a plethora of prophecy and then some about his return. For the sake of brevity, we can't go into it at length. But I don't expect you to take my word for it. Look it up yourself. Pick up a newspaper any day of the week. Is it really a coincidence that the same countries at the center of world events in scripture? Or at the center of world events today, you pick it up, it's Egypt, it's Syria, it's Israel, it's Arabia. No, 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 no. Jesus made it very clear in Luke 21, 24. Jerusalem will be trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is completed. The stage is being set for that to happen. Matthew 23, 39, you will not see me until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They must be in Jerusalem for him to return. It's happening. You see the Jews back there? It's the beginning of the end. Plethoron and ethnon until the Gentiles. Paul uses those same two terms in Romans chapter 11. Only he says, a time is going to come when Christians are going to stop being Gentiles and the Jews are going to believe again. The natural branches will be grafted in again. The epistle to the Romans in the book of Revelation makes it very clear, as does the Hebrew prophet Zechariah and Isaiah. The first Christians were Jews, and the last Christians will be Jews. You hear what I said? It's not what I said. It's what the scriptures say. The first Christians were Jews, and the last Christians were Jews. My wife's family were all wiped out in the Holocaust. Her family narrowly survived as children. Her parents, the rest were killed. And in Galilee, my little children growing up asking their grandparents in Hebrew, Saba Safta, Lama Atem Lo Maminim Be Meshichenu Yeshua? 
how come you don't believe in our Messiah, Jesus? It's the children and the grandchildren of the Holocaust that are turning to faith in Christ. 26 years ago, 26 years ago, the American College of Rabbis issued a statement saying more Jews have turned to Christ in North America in the last 18 years than in the last 18 centuries. That was 26 years ago. Now there are tens of thousands in the USA alone. When I first immigrated to Israel, there were about 200 Jewish believers in Jesus in the entire country. That was in the 1970s. Conservative estimate? Nobody knows. But at least six to 8,000 now. In less than 30 years. Scripture said it would happen. It's happening. It's happening. What else does it say? It's a bit involved, but if you read the Hebrew prophet Daniel, those same countries that were in the Roman Empire would reconfederate into a non-democratic Europe and set the stage for the Antichrist. They call it the European Union. They're desperately trying to make the iron stick to the clay, as Daniel said. It's not sticking. But they're going to make it stick artificially, but it won't last. Not a week goes by, they're not talking about peace in the Middle East. Oh, there will be a false peace in the Middle East. The Antichrist will make a treaty and break it. Then there'll be a true peace when the Messiah comes back and reigns from Jerusalem. Can you imagine scattered for 2,000 years, centuries of pogroms, and they're right back? If you told a Jew coming out of a concentration camp in 1945 with his family all dead and nothing but a rag on his back, that in three years he'd be back in the land of his forefathers, it would have seemed crazy to him, but there he is. This thing's never wrong. The Talmud is wrong. The Quran is wrong, the Book of Mormon is wrong, the Tibetan Book of the Dead is wrong, the Bhagavad Gita is wrong, the Aquarian Bible is wrong, but this is never wrong. I tried my best to disprove it. I tried to come up with a reason to deny its plausibility. I tried desperately. Everything's happening. A globalization of the world economy coming towards a one world money system, it's inevitable. Democratic countries like America and Great Britain that have turned their back on the faith of their forebearers, now democracy is disappearing. There's a reason democracy is evaporating all over the world. It's coming. Jesus said to be brought before magistrates and kings, courts. More and more judges are legislating from the bench. It's not the politicians you vote for, it's what the courts will decree. How did Jesus know that? The people in California vote Proposition 8, a homosexual judge outlaws it. Be brought before magistrates. And that judge issued a statement blaming, literally, in a court document, blaming Christianity for the rise of homophobia, as he put it. It's going to get more like this. Much more like this. It's Europe. It's the Middle East. It's the environment. It's the global economy. It's Israel and the Jews. But it is also the church. Jesus spoke more of deception in the church than he did of any other sign of his return. 
Turn on the idiot box. One con artist, money preacher after another, prostituting the word of God, making a mockery of real faith in Jesus. Unsaved people see right through these con artists. They drive people away from salvation. Jesus never said to make converts. He said to make disciples. Even if somebody does get saved, what do they get saved into? A racket? And people believe it. People who say they're Christians believe it. How could the church have become so crazy in one generation? But it has. And it's getting worse. And it's going to get worse still. But when Jesus comes, it's going to get better. Every one of those prophecies about his first coming happened. Every one. And now the prophecies about his second coming are taking place. Every one. It was 100% right the first time for his first coming. And it's so far 100% right the second time for his second coming. It's right, it was right, it is right, and it's going to be right. But if you're not ready for his return, you are wrong. I've got two time bombs. One in this hand, one in this hand. Two time bombs. Every day you live, every hour you live, is God giving you a chance to repent of your sin and accept Jesus. Hell is a real place. He doesn't want you to go there. But he says you will go there unless you trust Jesus to save you. Nobody else can, and certainly no religion. That's one time bomb. Tick, 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 tick. I just look in the mirror. My sexy Jewish wife can still wear the same dress she got married in. I can't fit through the door of the same church. <laughs> That's true of all of us. Tick, 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 tick. But then there's the other time bomb. The human race is running out of time. I've often told this story. I'm old enough to remember things like the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Cold War. I remember as a little boy in New York, Nikita Khrushchev came to Manhattan to the UN. I used to live across the street from the UN. And he was so crazy, he took off his shoe in the General Assembly and began pounding it on the podium saying, we will bury you, we will bury you. He went back to Russia, and in no time, the Politburo, Zinuviev, and Suslav, and Kasigin and those guys said, and Gromyko, we can't let a crazy person have his finger on the button. He was deposed in a matter of weeks. Then there was a book called The Final Days. During the Watergate crisis, Nixon called the stage three nuclear alert against the Soviets in October of 1973, and he was stoned on tranquilizers and alcohol all the time, and Kissinger and Haig were trying to keep him under control. And the leaders of the Republican Party, people like Ford and Goldwater, they said, this guy's nuts. We can't let this crazy man be in control of a nuclear arsenal, we gotta get rid of Nixon. His own party said, that's it. At least the Soviets thought somewhat rationally. At least the Americans thought somewhat rationally. Now Pakistan, an Islamic country, has a nuclear arsenal. Now India has a nuclear arsenal. You know what a radical Hindu in the BJP thinks? 
He'll be reincarnated as a Brahmin. He's not afraid to push the button. In fundamentalist Islam, the only assurance of salvation is to be shahadi, to die in a jihad. Allahu Akbar! Don't push the button. We're told in the scripture, if Jesus doesn't return, we'd wipe ourselves out. You understand that? If he doesn't return, we will wipe ourselves out. Our own government's pandering to Islam for the sake of the oil buck. We'll wipe ourselves out. But he is coming. I no longer have much hope for this place. But I have a hope. By a hope, I don't mean I wish. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is a future fact. I hope in something that's guaranteed. It's guaranteed for me because I know that Jesus took the rap for what I did. There's no reason he should have, but he did. He should have left me to my own devices, but he didn't. That is the only reason I am not eternally doomed is because God became a man and in his innocence took the blame for what I did. It doesn't matter if you believe it, agree with it or not, you will believe it someday. It's never been wrong. I have a hope. A sure hope. A blessed hope. But he wants you to have that hope too. Be you black or white, Asian or Western, Jew or Gentile, Catholic or Protestant, doesn't matter. No es importante. Jesús viene pronto un poco años. Este was muy verdad, hermana. Verdad? Este was muy verdad. Jesús viene pronto un poco años. To my Jewish friends, Meshicheno hits the deck, lavo, valamut, lichne, ha herban, shadabetu megdash hashemit, hu yavo bahazara. Language doesn't matter, race doesn't matter, nationality doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is you. The book is true. If you don't believe it today, you will believe it when it's too late. But it's not too late now. Now is the appointed time. Today is the day of salvation. Jesus has never turned anybody away. Not even me. He's never turned anybody away. And if you ask him to forgive you, if you really ask him to forgive you and give you a new life, God himself guarantees he's not going to turn you away either. He's not going to turn you away. No matter who you are, no matter what you did, he will not turn you away. But if you turn off your computer, switch off the screen or walk out that door, you're turning him away. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. God bless. Amen.